Hi, and welcome to episode 37 of the Chess TDD series. I'm uh, back at home with my standard podcasting setup and um, my computer and everything is normal. There are no crazy work things going outside. And I managed to record this episode in um, a sane amount of time. Looks like it's wrapping up here around 17 minutes. So a smooth episode all around after some choppy waters and previous ones. Um, So what I'm doing first to start with here is um, I'm going back and fixing, somebody pointed out in the comments correctly that I had transposed the the black queen and king, at least for some of these, I think in the um, uh, full chessboard template that I created. So I'm going to go back and fix it wherever it's wrong in the acceptance tests, and then I actually go back and fix the template as well. I looked at, um, I remember when I was doing this an episode or two ago, I actually looked at a chessboard visually and pulled it into the screen, but I think I confused myself about which piece was the king and the queen. Um, that's surprisingly easy to do. A lot of chess sets don't necessarily make it real clear which is which. Um, but also I'm pretty rusty when it comes to chess. Remember all the moves and I could probably play a decent game, but yeah, I don't know. So um, I went back and made some changes just to get everything um, uh, squared away in terms of having a setup that's correct. So, um, you know, I felt it was important to do that and not to let that linger. Um, I was fortunate in that as I was working on this, the pieces um, or none of the tests went red. I didn't have to like change any implementation or anything. Well, made a liar out of me right there. I should say that none of the tests went red in the sense that I had to like go dive into the code. It was um, all just a matter of uh, tweaking the piece or the the board coordinates based on where I was moving the pieces. Um, So then last and not least was to go in here and change the queen to king and vice versa and then save this template. So once I did this, it was time to move on. Um, The first thing I did was flip over to the Trello board and remind myself that there was a a bug from last time. So I was kind of refreshing my memory here in Queen. And it had to do with what I discovered was that the Queen, um, in her movement, when she was moving to the left... uh, she was not being blocked correctly by enemy pieces. So if there was an enemy piece directly to her left, she could move into that square, which was right. But then she was being able to move into the squares beyond it. So at the end of that long episode that I split into two parts, I hypothesized that, well, we might have the same um, problem for moving backwards. You can see that is not a um, use case that's covered here because the white queen is bounded by the board um, up against her back or i should i guess just say instead of backward and forward depending on where you're sitting in descending coordinate order so um the white queen isn't going to move from one to zero but if i create a scenario where i'm replicating this and um i surround the black queen with white pieces my hypothesis is that the black queen will be able to move um two four seven which she should be but then she'll be able to move to four six four five etc uh so i want to test out that hypothesis and that's an interesting lesson to take away um in terms of my approach i don't you know think of testing things uh like with the debugger or maybe ways that you might be used to like i'm going to test out these types of hypotheses always by writing tests because this is going to be a test, um, if I write it and it's wrong, or even if it's right, it, it should be true in general, so why not leave the test there? Why do something like step in through another test in the debugger or, or whatever, um, edit and continue, which I really uh, am not a fan of. So I wouldn't do anything like that. Instead, I'm going to try to get as much value out of my tests as I can, in this case by saying... Um, okay, here's a scenario in the acceptance test that I think won't work, so let's test that out. <clears throat> so before I know whether uh, my hypothesis is correct, I have to get the um, 
then clause here correct as well, which basically just involves um, changing the y coordinates here. It should anyway. So yeah, th should be three eight, five eight, so on and so forth, kind of inverted. Um, oh, and yeah, I accidentally uh, made them also black at first. So once I get this squared away, the test is failing, and I mouse over um, the failing test to see, yeah, so I was expecting five, but there's actually 10. And that told me at a quick glance that it indeed is what I thought, which is that um, the the reason you get so many more is that there's like five extra um, columns that sh or uh, rows that she can get to in that four column. So now I'm not going to go through in this case and write a unit test for this. I could. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. But given that I have a pretty good idea of what I think the problem is, um, I just implement the solution, which is to add that reverse again. And uh, that takes care of the failing test, so the bug is squashed. I also happen to notice, um, and this is another good lesson to take away, I see that somehow or another I don't have coverage on that line. So that um, private method has a test uh, or has a return condition that's never getting hit with any test. I'm not sure how I manage that. I'd have to go back, kind of comb through some of these videos, but um, usually I'm keeping the test coverage at 100%, so not quite sure what happened there, but um, that's an oops that I'd like to do something about. And um, in the te with the teams that I coach, uh, especially I stress this, the point isn't to have 100% test coverage. That's That's a metric. It's not a goal. The reason that I want that line of code to be covered isn't that... Um, you know, I'm trying to hit some magic number is that there's a return path through the code that I haven't reasoned about. And I don't like that. Um, so I want to get into that scenario and explore what's going on and come to understand better. And to be perfectly honest, that class is kind of ugly and could use some refactoring when, when we get a chance anyway. So those two concerns can go nicely together. If I were kind of running this like a implementation project, though, I'd probably not prioritize that particularly high. Um, maybe we've, you know, this has been going on for 37 episodes, and I'm trying to get something to market. So maybe we want to say, look, we'll get the all the peace movement acceptance test passing and then implement the actual chess moves like on passant and um, not sure what happened there uh, on passant castling, etc. And ship with, you know, uh, good to great test coverage and um, basically acceptance tests working for all chess movement as far as we know. Uh, so I would prioritize that stuff. I don't think in the context of this hypothetical production app that the slight messiness in that Pathmaker class is a huge problem. It's a mild amount of tech debt, and um, I might reshuffle those priorities as an imaginary product owner um, if we were looking to build a lot more on that. So with the cleanup having been taken care of at this point, I just move on to the Rook movement. And this is, um, you know, kind of back to the nice little cadence of uh, putting in these acceptance tests for functionality we've already put into place. So I am back to, especially with a few different bugs squashed, now we're kind of expecting that... Um, that these tests will go fairly smoothly. I mean, you never know, but <clears throat> I can give you a spoiler. They do for the rest of this episode. That's why I was able to wrap up in such tidy fashion. So in this particular test, um, I'm following the same pattern, more or less, that I have with some of these feature files now, which is I'm going to say, okay, um, not sure what I was doing with the copy and paste exactly, but if there's a... Um, this white rook at coordinate one, one, that basically, uh, well, not basically, exactly, I should be able to move that rook into any um, space in the same column or in the same row. And this is where I get into sort of the murky gray areas of whether it makes sense to do copy and paste stuff or not. You'll see me make a mistake here. Um, right about here where I go in and I blow away the row that I actually needed. Um, so I've mentioned this before. I won't go into a ton of detail about it now, but um, you do run the risk of seeing what happened here, which is that I spend enough time scratching my head and looking at this that I probably 
would have been faster just to type this out manually. Copy and paste always seems faster, but you would be shocked how often this very thing happens. <clears throat> now imagine the, I was the hare with copy and paste and the um, proverbial tortoise and hare. If I had been the tortoise and I had just been typing this out by hand, I probably would have been green already. So then moving on to the next test, I think I've got this pattern going where I say, okay, well, let's, <clears throat> let's put the piece on an empty board and see how it goes. Now let's put the, let's do a fully set up chessboard and test their initial movement, like what they should be able to do. Um, this is going to be a pretty uninteresting uh, <laughs> set of uh, potential moves here because none of the four rooks on the board are going to be able to go anywhere. So now I'm going to use my full chessboard template here through Code Rush, and you can see I have indeed fixed the um, black king and queen being flipped. So now I'm going to say, all right, the piece at 1-1 has exactly these moves, and there will be none. Uh, this time I was uh, bitten and then became shy about the copy and paste. Uh couldn't figure out the problem, but, you know, then again, here's another trade-off, which is that by not tab complete or copy and paste, I um, typed out the wrong thing. So, oops. And you can also see me stumbling a little. I figured out that that um, insert uh, or overwrite, whatever you call that type mode, I like never, ever, ever use that. But it's actually pretty handy for this chessboard and nothing else. So you see me flip back and forth and kind of get screwed up a little here and there. Um, but such is life. So this um, this is also pretty uneventful. Uh, you can see now I go back on my thinking and say, all right, I'm going to copy and paste, and this time it'll work. And then it does. So, oh, well. I feel a little vindicated in doing copy and paste um, in these uh, spec flow features. As I mentioned before, there's kind of my lack of familiarity with it. But it's also you know, kind of a, the murky area between copied English language and um, code. Like, I wouldn't do this kind of thing in pure source code, uh, but this is meant to have a visual clarity and appeal to it for people that are not um, necessarily programmers. So you wind up in situations where the duplication actually... Um, offers a certain kind of advantage. So um, again, continuing in the same vein, what I want to test here, I have the hypothesis that my rook should be able to go and capture the opponent rook in the last square, and I should have the same range of movement as I did with the rook on the empty board, because um, whether he's capturing or um, just moving to that end piece, it doesn't matter. He should be able to move there. So that's borne out. That's good news. And then the one thing, you know, with all the problems we've had with um, the bug around reverse, um, I wanted to check for the condition of the rook being in the corner and being surrounded. Um, I wanted to check in the lower left-hand corner as we're looking at the board and the upper right-hand corner. So I'm going to do the white white queen's rook first and surround the rook with pieces um it shouldn't matter for the rook but i i did stick a piece um that would block it if it had diagonal range of movement um just you know completely boxing it in um i don't know that it yeah, probably makes any difference one way or the other that's the piece there that bishop um the rook wouldn't be able to move there anyway but um i guess you know whether I put a piece there or not really doesn't matter in the end. Uh, I think maybe it was just for the aesthetic in my mind of having it be like actually surrounded. Um, so this now, the rook's movement should be reduced to two possible moves. It can go capture either one of those black rooks. And that works out. That one I wasn't too worried about because um, it seems in general the movement has been bug-free for situations where we're going up and to the right. Uh, down and to the left have been a little more problematic, so I will test both of those now. 
So I'm going to create another empty chessboard, and then we're going to put a black rook up in the corner and surround the black rook with white rooks and a white bishop. And now, yeah, you can see me struggling with insert. Control Z is a very good friend of mine. Anytime I get into a situation where I'm like, whoa, what was that? I'd back up, back up. <laughs> It's much more possible or it, um, you don't worry about overrunning with uh, that's a subtle thing, but I guess like with test driven development and the visual feedback of the tests, um, I know when I've gone just the right amount of control Z cause everything goes green. If I go back too far, then it goes red again. So moment of truth. Um, I'm expecting those two moves and sure enough, the test goes green. So at this point, about 15 minutes in, um, I think I just kind of look back through, do a little formatting. Um, I just coded this, so I should know better. Um, so we still have the bit of housekeeping to do here where I move this over, and then I kind of messed around here in Trello because I don't know at what point um, these things got out of the order that I wanted, but I'm looking here and saying, hey, it looks like something's missing, and oh, yeah, I got to do the bishop. So I went and added a card at the end and then realized that, oh, wait, I had it. Um, so sorry to waste your time with that. Say la vie, I suppose. Um, and then the other thing I did is I've been trying to be good about um, uh, committing to source control and then pushing up to GitHub um, as part of the code cast. It just seems to create some nice bookending here to say, like, look, you know, we actually do source control our code. That's important. It's a thing that matters. Plus, if I get it wrong and... Um, <clears throat> omit a newly added file by mistake or something i'm hoping somebody will tell me more eyes on it is always uh always better so anyway this was a pretty carefree kind of episode everything went well um hopefully that continues i will uh, see you next time around and thanks for watching